Of Silence and Shatterings, a memoir. This is the kind of story that spans an afternoon. It is told in first person omniscient where hindsight is 2020. If I do my job correctly, you will have no choice but to carry on with this weight and resonance emblazoned in the dark matter between cornea and eyelid. Nothing is as simple as it seems. The world is not black and white, but an innumerable amount of grays in between, not 50, mind you. An infinite spectrum of individual experience and circumstance that makes us flawed and human. A book is not simply a few hundred pages bound between two pieces of cardboard, but a relationship trapped between realities until it is read. Sophia Lee's life had always been just that, hers, apostrophe S, possessive noun until the summer of 2014 when it wasn't. Her mother, Sabrina, had been diagnosed with esophageal cancer in September of 2012. However, it wasn't until Where Our Story Begins that Sophia actually comprehends that the woman who adopted her from Shanghai, China, when she was 13 months old, can no longer take care of her. At that point, everything in Sophia's life had changed. Well, time's up for the day. You don't have to talk to me, but you need to express what you're feeling to somebody. I'm going to speak with your mother before I leave. Do I have permission to tell her about what you said today? Bianca says, caps her pen, and slides it into its appointed place on her clipboard. Sophia wonders if the clipboard is devoid of words because Bianca's reluctant patient refused to say anything of importance. The other, more likely outcome being that every line was scribbled in wannabe therapist shorthand as she meticulously recorded every time Sophia took a sip of water only to set the glass down and recross her arms. Bianca isn't even a licensed psychologist because those are the kind you go out of your house to see. Yet it seems the reluctant focus of our story can, can't leave the house without making it a must-attend event inclusive of mother, daughter, life support machines, and everyone stares accompanying them. Fine, Sophia replies, staring down into her lap. Bianca nods to acknowledge the response, remembering that indifference is even worse than sarcasm or petulance from adolescent guinea pigs. Sophia listens for the wood to cease creaking under the chunky and even blue carpet that envelops the staircase. When she knows Bianca is on her way to the other end of the house, she entangles her arms and legs from their cross positions to creep downstairs. Once there, she listens to the absurd analysis of her mental state Bianca tells her mother and aunt. As if they had conspired to do so, the door was left open just enough for Sophia to watch them converse in the sunflower slash mac and cheese room, the name dependent on who was referring to it. Serious voices speaking to them, reading aloud the carefully composed paragraphs Sabrina had typed in preparation for this discussion. Sophia bristles against the monotonous recitation, so unlike how her mother would have expressed her concerns had she been able to speak. The cancer had compelled the doctors to perform a tracheotomy, which, in non-medical terms, is an incision in the windpipe to help a person breathe. Be that as it may, freedom for the windpipe comes at expense to the vocal cords. The 29th of May was the last time Sabrina Lee spoke to her little girl turned isolated teenager, who now refused to communicate voluntarily. In addition, that was the last day her main character truly considered her mother alive. Sophia sunk away from their conversation, her mother's concern conveyed in Siri's bone-chilling voice, still reverberating through her thoughts. Upstairs is safe. Upstairs is where Sophia has the slightest bit of control over the Pandora's box her entire life had been carelessly chucked into. This was where she could wrangle in the forged interactions between the pro and antagonist. She exhales freely, selecting a book from the stack of ten that teetered precariously on the slab of wood dating to call itself a nightstand. The particular title, raised to would either be the chopping block or the podium of Sophia's critical opinion, was audacious. A novel written verse by Gabrielle Prendergast. Sophia dons her earbuds, now a necessary part of the armor, carefully worn so as to prevent any casualties between her family and her feelings. The soundtrack is a perfect match with the scene we are confronted with. The jungle of thorns erected in defense looms over experience, as we have no choice but to delve into the horrors the antagonist has prepared. Quite simply, no more Panem met substances than required, Sophia begins to read. She reads and reads and reads, only pausing to free a poster from its adhesive brethren and lay it on a page she has deemed worthy of remembrance. Audacious follows 16-year-old Raphael, who, when confronted with the hierarchy known as high school, merely laughs in its face. She considers herself having broken free from the rose-colored glass it seems that everybody else in her small midwestern town remains encased in. 
as an intentional act of self-expression against the transient, flippant attitude of those living in her community, Raphael takes a sexually explicit photo of herself, and that is the unquestionable point at which Sophia knows this is no ordinary book. Sophia soaks in each page, absorbing the antidote of action and disregard to consequences each word of audacious provides. The story is the first sound she has heard in weeks, the solution of gorgeously gritty writing and relatable Raphael disbanding the heavily guarded wall of emotions felt towards her mother's illness. Sophia's identity had been a fast-flowing river beneath a frozen lake, but the ice had finally cracked. Sophia's disposition toward her present state wasn't going to 180 into the empathetic kumbaya singing daughter people wanted her to be. But she was no longer the shell. Maybe she was exhausted, or maybe she didn't want to resist rescue any longer. From my day she slept the spark, one of righteousness and awareness, and get off your ass to confront the worldness that had been missing. Its fuse went straight for the jugular, which converted the angry, resentful skeleton of a girl into flesh, a circulatory system now running on the oxygenated passion it had missed for so long. Sophia wouldn't respond to the situation at the extreme degree Raphael had, but she was finally respondent. At last, she could curse whatever faith she still had in humanity, in God, in whatever the hell had placed her in this position. Her summer days were spent playing bed nurse for her sick mother. Her nights endured as she awaited the banging of a gong to alert her to attention so she could resume the position kept during the day. Reading Audacious unlocked every ounce of selfishness, passion, remorse, and sympathy that, that had been out of her reach. When Sophia closed the book, she was no longer content with the way she had been carrying on since her mother's prognosis worsened. Instead, the productive, motivated book blogger and future great American author had returned. However, it was too late for her to slip back into the skin she had been separated from, and she would be forced to use every ounce of gained energy to continue living, for more than herself. The 27th of July, 2014, was the last day Sabrina would reside in the home she had spent half of her 60 years in. That very night, her sister Jennifer decided she and Sophia weren't adequate enough to take care of their stage four sister and mother. The two of them watched the ambulance take her away, and by noon on the 29th, she was dead. While Sophia Sage Lee was the unwilling main character of this story, you as the reader deserve to know, I too am Sophia Sage Lee. This is my story, scripted, directed, edited, and presented by yours truly. The narrative style maintained for two reasons, one of which being the predicted difficulty of writing from a first-person account of how the events played out. The subsequent reason being, I don't believe I am the same person the events of the story followed. Don't worry, I promise there aren't any dissociative personality disorders at play, but simple recognition of the evolution my identity underwent. The state of mind I kept up from the 29th of May to the 29th of July is what I hope to never return to, seeing as it was the most negative, toxic, unhealthy one I've contained myself in. I write this now with the knowledge that whatever you're struggling with, no matter how unhappy you are, it will pass. You have been shattered, may think of yourself as dirty or damaged, but the feeling can only last for so long. The pieces that are no longer relevant have been discarded. What remains is rearranged and plastered onto the mosaic of who you have become. The 25,815 words and audacious arrived on the doorstep of my life exactly when they are most needed, and I firmly believe the journey to recovery would not have begun as swiftly without everything this novel compelled me to feel, when I didn't want to feel anything at all. So, I suppose the only question now is to ask, what do you think? Of Silence and Shatterings was recently posted on my blog. I'll link it below. I have the whole full-blown text version. I read it verbatim, so you have gotten all the content that you could out of it, but in case you want to reread it or go back to certain parts, you can do that. If I do find the courage to post this, then I'm just gonna give myself a round of applause right now, just because this is me. This is my writing. It is 100% true. Facts are exactly as they are, and I tried not to alter the dialogue any more than what I remembered, though obviously I can't remember perfectly. I've been posting videos on loving the language of literacy since October of 2014. I've mentioned here and there about my mother's esophageal cancer and me moving to New York. This is basically the most all-encompassing view you can get of the exact moments and reasons and the feelings that I underwent during this time of my life, which was very tumultuous. That's probably the best word I can use. I wrote this as part of my application for the Bard College Simons Rock Young Writers program. 
I'm crossing my fingers I get in. I will definitely share with all of you on this channel whether or not I do get in, and I'll put it in the description box when I find out. The guidelines were to write about a very specific time of your life when words impacted you. I actually wrote an entire essay before this, and I didn't scrap it in terms of threw it away, but I scrapped it in terms of fulfilling the prompt. And I knew I could dig a little bit deeper and turn it a little bit more into a narrative. That's why I almost want to call this a short story. By definition, this is a memoir. But essentially, audacious by Gabrielle Prendergast changed everything. I'm hoping that I got my message across and I'm hoping I conveyed well enough how much of a negative headspace I was in during this time of my life. And I truly do hope I accomplished the prompt as well as what I set out to do with it. Tell me in the comments below if you would like me to share more writing, if you want me to talk more about my own life, if you want more personal videos like this, just tell me your feedback, tell me what you think. I'm totally okay with constructive criticism. I really want to hear your opinion because this is unlike anything I've ever posted before. And I just, I really want to get my courage to share more of my writing with you on this channel. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. Keep calm, read on, and I will see you in a video very soon. Goodbye. If you enjoyed this video and liked it tomorrow, like it, give it a big thumbs up, leave a comment below. If you liked it even more, hit the subscribe button. All my social media is at S Sells, both Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, etc. And my previous video.